Well, good evening. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, as I was driving home last week, I had all these things running through my head that I intended to say the previous week, and then Wayne's nodding his head. I'm sure other teachers do the same thing as you're going, oh, I didn't talk about this or that. And so I thought, I'm going to have to be sure and put a note in my <laughs> PowerPoint so I'll be sure and mention all those things so I can remember all those things. <laughs> All right, so we're going to be talking about spiritual leadership and starting off just trying to define, well, what is spiritual leadership? Do we have leadership problems in the world today, in culture? What kind of problems do we have? A lack of it. I mean, we don't, we don't have good leadership around the world at the moment. You know, right. About politicians and so forth. You know. Yeah. Hit the nail on the head. No confidence votes. You see that quite a bit. Recall elected officials. They don't like the decisions they're making. They don't like the leadership that they have. And so they're recalling these people. Um, I, I didn't know if I was going to tell this story or not. I don't know if you guys follow financial news. Bed, Bath & Beyond is what that stands for. Um, the CFO of Bed, Bath & Beyond had manipulated their stock so the price went up and he could sell his shares of stock and then the price fell back down. Well, the SEC let him know that we're investigating this and he jumped off the balcony of his high-rise apartment in New York City. And so they're looking for a new leadership at BBY. BBBY. Are there leadership problems in the church? Thankfully, we have a good example, I mean, a good person here, a good authority. That's probably the, Chris's main focus is finding good leaders in New Zealand and getting leadership set up to manage the churches down there. Um, other congregations, not necessarily North Mac, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of churches out there that are just really struggling, and it's because of their leadership. And we went to visit Rhonda's mother and the, the congregation that she attends. The preacher resigned and left. The song leader resigned and left. All the elders resigned. And the big turnover in the membership. Uh, and it's just, it, it's a sad situation. And so I sent Tim an email. I said, you know, you don't know how good you've got it until you sit in somebody else's pews. <laughs> so... He said, yeah, he, he said that going around and, and speaking at other congregations, he sees some of that, sees some of the problems that they're having. So, but churches, not only in the state, all over the U.S., all around the world, if you have weak leadership, you're going to have problems. Thankfully, and, and I told Chris, I said, uh, Chris, I told Tim that, you know, we are just really blessed with the elders that we have with the elders that we had in the past. They're strong, they're biblically sound, spiritually minded. It's just a great group of leaders that we have. And, and I think that's a lot of the reason why we have so many blessings and, and we're not struggling like other churches are is because of the leadership that we have. As far as the need for new leaders, in the business world and in churches, they say that, that we're really hurting. And this quote is from a University of Michigan professor, Noel Titchy said, the tank is low, our leadership pipelines are broken. And trying to find somebody to fill in, fill the shoes, you know, if somebody has to step down for health reasons or you know, whatever the reason is, well, who's gonna do that job now? And they went through that when I was going to leave work. They said, who are we going to get to replace you? And I said, oh, they'll just train some other monkey and, <laughs> and just keep going. And they said, no. They've let me know that they've missed me, and they, they've called me several times wanting me to come back. Um, George Barna is a Christian researcher, and there's, he gets quoted by a lot of people. He, he's uh, kind of taken over that role of leadership or of uh, the, all the research and the surveys that he does. The central conclusion is that the American church is dying due to the lack of strong leadership. In this time of unprecedented opportunity and plentiful resources, 
the church is actually losing influence. The primary reason is the lack of leadership. And something that um, Brothers urged in his book is having these training classes, like getting the young men up to lead our worship service. I mean, that's a, a starting point for them. And a lot of churches are facing crisis. There are churches failing, closing like crazy. Um, in the decade ending 2020, so between 2010 and 2020, 3,800 to 7,700 houses of worship, not just churches of Christ, this is all denominations, all religions, that closed per year in the last 10 years. That was according to religionnews.com. The Christian Chronicle said that in the last 30 years, 1,209 churches of Christ have closed their doors. Well, where are all the churches? In the United States, there's 11,600, I'm sorry, 965 congregations in the United States. Over half of them are right here in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Alabama. And they say that Texas and Tennessee has a third of that number. Most of the congregations are in Texas and Tennessee. You get outside this, I've lived in this part of the country all my life, but you go outside this area, it's hard to find a church, it's find, especially one that's biblically sound. They may have Church of Christ on the name out front, but you go inside and you don't recognize them. Defining leadership. In Lead Like the Lord, Kirk Brothers, his research revealed one common word that appeared in most of the quotes that were defining leadership. And he asked all sorts of um, university presidents and, and people like that. And so he had all these quotes from them. Guess what the word, the most commonly used word in their definition? Anyone? Influence. A leader is someone who has a lot of influence, a lot of encouragement to the people around them. A long wordy quote here. A seminar president, Albert Moeller, I believe that leadership is all about putting the right beliefs into action and knowing on the basis of convictions what those right beliefs and actions are. This book is written with a concern that far too much of what passes as leadership is mere management. Without convictions, you might be able to manage, but you cannot really lead. Mere management. Avoiding my work uh, comments. <laughs> leadership goals. Leadership is not just moving people. It's not being a dictator and pointing and saying, go rake that grass or whatever it is, whatever the job is, some task. It's not managing them, but you're leading them. It's more of a demonstration. Moving people in the right direction is based on right convictions. Tim gave a lesson about this, about, remember when he was talking about conversion? And the first thing that has to happen is they have to be convicted before they can make that change. And a leader is able to make the right convictions. Right convictions must be biblically based or based on biblical truth. Leaders shape and influence people. Aubrey Johnson said, doing good to others is a trademark of true leadership and genuine greatness. Doing good to others. Um, quick story. We had some new neighbors move in behind us, and so I thought, well, I'll, I'll, to be nice, I, I made a pan of cinnamon rolls and took to them, but I didn't know he was uh, highly allergic to gluten. It gives him like MS symptoms if he eats gluten. So he, well, thank you very much, and he gave the cinnamon rolls to his son. So <laughs> they ended up, uh, the family enjoyed them, but he had to pass. But I've been, you know, that first year, we took cucumbers and things out of the garden to them, 
and they just absolutely loved it. And, and uh, one time he was needing an electrician. He said, hey, do you have one? I said, matter of fact, I've got one coming to the house next week. And so I took him over and introduced him and, and he replaced the, the, what, you know, fixed what he was needing replaced. And he was just so excited about it. Well, come to find out, it's Talia English's parents. Talia English was visiting in the auditorium or in the uh, gym when we were doing the social distance over there. And uh, just before McCallum was born, and uh, it was funny, we just got to talking, and, and she, she said, where do you live? And I said, well, way up north, May and Coffee Creek. And she said, my parents live up there. Really? And so we got to talking, and, and lo and behold, I said, is your dad's name Mick? <laughs> she said, yeah. I said, he lives right behind me. And she goes, you're Kenny. She said, I feel like I know you because you've done so much for my dad already. <laughs> so... It's funny, just doing good to others. Our goals should be God's goals. We, we have to have them aligned. We don't want to have a, a goal that's going to take us off track away from what we should be doing. So brothers, he finally, taking all of their definitions that these people gave him, what spiritual leadership is, and kind of rolled them all together, and this is what he came up with. Spiritual leadership describes the actions of a servant leader who follows God's example and uses God's gifts to guide people towards God's goals for God's glory. We're going to dissect this a little bit. It describes the actions of a servant leader. It's somebody that's willing to do and not just order people around. It's somebody that's going to, they're willing to put on the work clothes and do, they don't mind doing the work themselves. The servant leader, they lead not for self, not to be recognized or be seen. They're leading for the benefit of the group that they're, that's being led. God's example. God shows us how. Integrity. Without integrity, we're not going to be anything. But if we're, if we're being a good, godly example... People are going to recognize that. They're going to see that. And they're going to say, there's something different about you. God's gifts, the ability that God has given you to do these things. To guide people. Um, one of the people that he quoted in all the influences was David Shannon, who's, uh, let's see, he's president of David Lipscomb, no, of Fried Hardeman, right? David Shannon, and so his, his comment was that, that a spiritual leader is an influencer. He is, you know, he's a people mover. He's somebody that can get people to, to do what needs to be done. And, of course, God's goals, not our goals, but God's goals, and everything is to be done to the glory of God, to glorify the church. So spiritual leadership describes the actions of, of a servant leader who follows God's example and uses God's gifts to guide people towards God's goals for God's glory. That was the definition that he came up with. Well, I thought we'd take a little bit. We're going to uh, take a sidetrack here. We're going to talk about David. A leader like David. And, of course, a man after God's own heart. I... I I've heard that phrase for years. Do you know the situation when this came up, when it was said he was a man after God's own heart? It's right after he's been anointed. And so Samuel goes to Saul to explain that his kingdom is, your kingdom is done, it's finished. And God has selected, he's chosen someone to replace you, a man after his own heart. So that's where that phrase comes from. And then it's repeated in Acts 13 in verse 22. Paul is uh, giving a lesson and he, he cites that. He, he quiets the crowd and, and he's going through history and telling the, the, the story over and over again. Well, David's accomplishments. Of course... Right away, he gets promoted to be the armor bearer and the musician for King Saul, waiting on him. He slays Goliath. 
he had many military victories, defeating the Philistines. He was, it seemed like he was always at battle with the Philistines. Well, those were his good things. What about the downfalls? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. Murdering. Murdering. Yeah, Uriah the Hittite. And I've got one more. He wasn't allowed to build the temple. He wanted to build a permanent structure for God. He wanted to build the temple, and God said no because he's shed too much blood. He didn't want him to build the temple. And, of course, we mentioned uh, that he committed adultery with Bathsheba. You know, and, and I hadn't really connected the dots at this point uh, or up until this week, I guess. He's already living in the palace. How many wives does he have? Second Samuel 3 lists six of the wives that he had, and they didn't mention Michael because he never had any children. Michael never had any kids. Uh, that was Saul's daughter that was given to him. So he already had six or seven wives before he commits adultery with Bathsheba, and then she gets pregnant. And so he brings Uriah the Hittite back. Well, Uriah didn't play along with the script that he had in his mind. And so he had Uriah the Hittite killed. So one sin just led to another. It just kind of... Uriah hit the Hittite because he made a character and it cost him his life. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to be with my wife while my men are in battle. And... Um, the way Nathan exposed it to David, that was just, that was classic. Loved it. All right. So David's words of wisdom. Uh, 1 Kings 2, verses 1 through 4. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, if your son pays close attention to their walk, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel." Be strong, show yourself a man, keep charge of the Lord. Um, it's funny, how, and maybe you've experienced this, where you, you'll be studying and there's a phrase that comes up. And it seems like every time I turn around, that phrase was coming up this week. And when Dylan was doing the Devo just now, and he's going to read from Job, well, twice in Job uh, in 38 and also in 40, he said to, um, um, I'm going to have to look it up. Some, he uses the phrase, like a man. Job 38 and verse 3. Get ready for a difficult task like a man. And when he read that, I just went, oh, little flag went up. <laughs> Be strong, show yourself a man, and keep charge of the Lord. And there's the same statement that he says, to obey his word, follow his commands, his testimonies. Solomon was blessed with a father, a wise father. He had a spiritual guide to help him go down the right path. A man after God's own heart. 2018, the Census Bureau said that one in four children do not have a father figure at home. I thought that seemed a little low. There's a, a website called fathers.com. They say 39% of school aged children do not have a father at home. It's pretty shocking. So, where I'm, are these? I'm surprised, Kenny. That's, that number is way too low. I think. Yeah. I, I'm thinking it, you know, it could be as high as even 50%. Yeah. Times I've dealt with in school systems been the biggest change who's your daddy yeah i don't have one yeah so 
the big question is, where are these 19.5 million kids going to get their advice? Where are they getting that guidance, that leadership? If they don't, if they're missing a parent, not to take away from what the mothers do. This is the trend that we see, though. The effects of having no father in the home, poverty, unemployment, drugs, school dropouts, having children out of wedlock, and prison. It's just an ugly spiral without that leadership. The wisdom of father passes along. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Listen, children, to a father's instruction and pay attention so that you may gain discernment because I hereby give you good instruction. Do not forsake my teaching. Verse 3 and 4, continuing. When I was a son to my father, a tender only child before my mother, he taught me and he said to me, let your heart lay hold of my words. Keep my commandments so that you will live. And now jumping down to verse 11. I hereby guide you in the way of wisdom and I lead you in the upright paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hampered and when you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Protect it because it is your life. Verse 14. Do not enter the path of the wicked or walk in the way of those who are evil. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and go on. Does that sound like some other scriptures? First thing I thought of was Psalms 1 and then 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and we'll put those up in just a second. Finally, he says, do not turn to the right or to the left. Turn yourself away from evil. Those 19 and a half million kids, they don't have a father giving them instructions like this, telling them to turn away from evil. The influence of evil. Evil companions will entice you to do evil. Proverbs 1.10, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. In verse 15, my son, do not walk in the way with them Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. And there's 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Quick story. Um, when I was in high school, um, I'm going to say an acquaintance. We weren't good friends, he lived in Guthrie, and I lived in Newcastle. I already gave, told you more about him than I intended. <laughs> um, it was Christmas break, and some evil companions influenced him. You know, there's, they're not in school. They're bored. Hey, let's go do something. So there was teenage drinking involved, and... Up by where they lived, there was an overpass that went over I-35, and they went out on the overpass and decided, hey, let's drop rocks and see if we can hit the cars as they come by. Well, he dropped a rock, went through the windshield, killed the driver, the car went off the road, killed the entire family. They were headed to, they were just passing through Oklahoma, headed to Abilene to go visit relatives, for the holidays, you see the Christmas presents in the back window of the car. Well, they drove off. It's a gravel road. There's no tracks. The police didn't have a clue. They didn't know who did it. But his conscience got to bothering him. He told his friends, I got to go turn myself in. So he did. He had to pay the price. He spent 40 years in prison. A um, friend told me he was paroled recently, so he's out now. But what a, a sad situation to have your whole life ruined by something just that quick, making a bad decision. Even at that young age, a teenager, 
and he spends the rest of his, you know, most of his adult life in prison because of it. And I, I used to teach high school classes, and I'd always tell them his story to warn them to make good decisions. Stay focused on the goal. This just goes right along with the theme that we have this year, to fix our eyes on Jesus. Keeping that goal in sight. Keeping your eyes on the target, whether you're plowing or shooting a, a gun or a bow and arrow. If, you're not, if you don't have your eyes fixed on the target, you're not going to hit the target. Yeah, and you, I've seen these guys, they do demonstrations like at the Thunder Game or something, where they go out there and they'll blindfold them. And <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to be sitting behind that goal. <laughs> Let them shoot at a target with a blindfold on. Here, put this apple on your head. <laughs> uh, but we talked about that a little bit last week, talking about the plowing. And, and if you want to plow a straight furrow, you have to keep your eye on a target that's in the distance. You're not looking right here in front of the tractor tires. Of course, as he said, they have GPS to do that now. <laughs> they don't have to drive it manually anymore. If we stay focused, we will reach our goal. We have to keep our goals aligned with God's goal keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus so that we're staying on the right path. Staying convicted and committed to that goal and not giving up halfway through the race. I, I had a friend from high school that did that. He was just, just very energetic and just a dynamic guy. They would always have him do the devotionals when we'd go skating on Sunday nights. And he was just, he was a great influence. And, but then after high school, never saw him again. And I, I asked about him, they said, yeah, he quit coming to church even. Don't know what happened. He just decided he'd had enough. It was sad. Like David said, be strong, show yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord following his commands. I feel like I've talked the whole time. Questions, comments? I had, I had a, it's totally kind of going back to your throwing a rock story uh, about the morals. Kind of like your, your mind just kind of eats at you. I had a, a friend and his sister got kind of mixed up in the wrong crowd and then uh, they ended her and then they just dropped her off like out in the field in the middle of nowhere and nobody would have known but the guilty conscience and the girl, it was a girl, it was a girl, finally nobody turned herself in. So when you said that, I'm like, man, that's, that's hit me on that. It's like yeah. bad company. Just yeah. corrupted them, corrupted her. And, but. Well, they stood out too, the same story, but the, but you pointed out some of the things about David, about the disadvantages or whatever, the census. Yeah. Where he had to own up to it and, and lost a lot of people because of that decision. Right. Anyone else? I can't believe we got through early again this week. <laughs> I think one, uh, one thing that kind of seems like it's part of culture today is like, I'm going to stay in my lane and like, I'm not responsible for anything yeah. like outside of the little, the little bitty bit that I'm doing right now. And I mean, you know, I work five days, you know, four or five days a week. That's the uh, best thing that I can, you know, I can kind of grasp to. And I see that a lot where, where a lot of the people I work with are, are kind of the same way. Like, you know, it's like I'm only dealing with this one little bit. And then when something comes up that doesn't really agree with either one, then, you know, a project kind of, you know, tries to get pushed away and pushed away and pushed away and then becomes a huge problem. Yeah. Um, well, and, and the ownership of, of something when it comes up, and um, and I think that's a big part of leadership. If something does come up like that, then it's a lot of more.
working with, you know, working with the people that um, that you're serving to try to figure those things out, um, because you know, or else you know, things just can't go go over the books. Yeah, I, I was shocked at, on the news the other night talking about the the shooting at the Arby's, just right up the street here, and. Uh, That wasn't what it was about, was it? <laughs> but it was a it was a young kid that was in training, and the instructor told him something that he didn't like, and he went out to his car and got his gun and came back and shot him. When was this? Um, two nights ago. Sixteen years old. Yeah. Yeah. An employee that that shot his trainer. Mm. Man. You know, Kenny, there are just so many mixed messages that are out there. When we take a look at the verses that you just posed to us tonight, and you start thinking about leadership, um, it, it's the, the church has been in, infiltrated with, I, I think the, the, the biggest thing we're hearing is more of, not here, but women serving as elders, women who are taking the leadership. And I've often asked the question, why is that? Yeah. And, and the answer it boils back to maybe a couple of things. One is that the men are not ready to step to the plate. Uh, they're, they're taking every, well, I, I don't want the liability that goes along with that. I, I don't want the responsibility and if we continue to do what we've done, uh, we're going to be called legalists, or we're going to be called traditionalists, yeah. or we're going to get all of these labels, these names that really isn't intended from what God. If I read the scriptures correctly, um, I think that what we what we we purpose in our heart, God is going to, to take care of us if we're headed in the right direction. But He's also going to take care of those who are headed in the wrong. I just think that it's we need to be aware of those things and be praying about them because the church uh, is uh, is struggling worldwide with some of these same issues. Yeah, I I have a cousin whose husband was not a strong leader. Her father was not a strong leader, and, but her daughter has gone to the Pentecostal church so she could be a preacher. So it, it's sad that. That that branch of the family, it was the women who were the the leaders in the family, and the men just were happy sitting on the sidelines. Yeah. So, sad situation. Yes. A title and getting the recognition, yeah. I haven't thought of that too because I mean, one thing like Wayne, you brought up like women starting to lead more and stuff like that too because people want to step up. It makes me think of Barack and Deborah because in the story of Barack and Deborah, Barack is given a job and he says no unless he kind of makes the you know 
she says, I'll do it, but you have to do something for me. That's the thing. Mm. But doesn't really want to be the leader. So I think that God will allow people to step up and cover because if you're not going to do your job, somebody has to do it for you. Yeah. And I think that's kind of like where some of those things come from. And then to hit on her point, we're called to be a servant. Like you, you got a great example of David because he led a huge nation and one of the most prosperous nations of all time. But I mean, the servant is the leader. So one that's actually willing to give up everything. Because when we think about Jesus and leading like the Lord, he could have been a king. He could have had 10,000 angels. But he was a servant. Right. And he did that all the way until his death. So, I mean, I think that giving up ourselves and like actually serving others, that leads us into serving like the Lord. Yeah. And like, her, like she said, it's not about a job. Yeah. Come to earth to wash feet. <laughs> yeah. All right, anyone else? Next week we're going to be talking about centered and uh, Chris Melinda for your benefit. All of his chapters start with a C. So from here through the, the remainder of the quarter, we're going to be talking about centered and communication and coaching and a bunch of C words. To, that's supposed to be a glue to help you remember all these things. So we're going to be talking about Jesus understood his purpose. He knew why he came to earth. He had a reason to be here and had that goal. All right, let's have a word of prayer.